Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like a fire. I just want. For fear and all anxiety To every soul held captive by depression I speak Jesus Your name, your name is power Your name is healing Your name
your holy name, Jesus. We magnify and exalt your name in this place, Jesus. You would be lifted up here in this place, God. This name, this name is above every name and is glorified here in our midst because this is a Jesus church. Amen? This is a Jesus church because we believe there is only one way to salvation and it's the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We praise you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for meeting us here today in this time of worship, Lord. And we're looking forward to what you have to say to us today, God. Our, we're ready, God. We came here ready tonight. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. It's, it's hard to stop singing that. <laughs> it's hard to stop singing that song. Amen. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Well, it's, it's good to be here tonight with all of you. Um, glad you're here tonight. If you're here for the first time and you've never been here before, we want to welcome you with a round of applause. So applause everyone tonight. Thank you for being here. If you've never been here, please, please fill out in the bulletin the Hey, I'm Here section and put it in the offering bucket so a pastor can pray for you, right? Um, if you don't want prayer, put my name on there. He can pray for me. So, so amen. Praise God. Let's rehearse our vision tonight together. Our vision here is win the lost, establish the believer, Demonstrate the love of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. It is such a good vision. I get excited about it every time. I want to see, I want to see people come to know Jesus, right? It is, it is, listen, you can't, you can't get anything better than sharing Jesus with someone and seeing them accept the Lord. And even if you're just the seed planter or you're the seed waterer, there's nothing better, right? And then after they get saved and praise God we had a few hands raised this Sunday so pray please pray for whoever raised their hands this Sunday who accepted Jesus because boy the enemy wants to come and steal that seed That's true. so pray for them pray for them and, and if you see people in church you've never seen before please smile welcome them say hello because you know people want to feel like they're connected you know we we need each other there is no church without all the rest of us this is just a building well, God, because God dwells in each of us when we come here together, there's a mighty presence of God and a mighty power of God, and we all, we all share that with each other. Amen? And then we got to demonstrate the love of God, right? So don't forget to, like I said, say hello, hug somebody, right? And uh, the power of the Holy Spirit. Pastor keeps offering us the opportunity. If you haven't been filled with the Holy Spirit and you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you could always come see me. I'd be happy to pray for you. And so that you could receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues. I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade that for anything in the world. God um, showed me that when I was first saved. So you want that too. Amen? So I'm going to give you the tithe message tonight. Um, I just want to talk about God being faithful. Because I don't know about the rest of you, but you know, being a human being like we are, some days we're in a mood like we don't feel like doing stuff. <laughs> I don't feel like going out, I don't feel like getting dressed, don't feel like, you know, don't feel like going somewhere, don't feel like talking, like, it's just being human, right? Thank God he's not like us, right? Amen. He doesn't have these, like, fickle moments. He's faithful, right? And faithful means remaining loyal and steadfast, and it's true to the facts, true, true to the facts, so when, when God tells us to bring our tithe to the storehouse or when he tells us to give, like it says in Proverbs nineteen seventeen, it says, if you help the poor, you are lending to the Lord and he will repay you. It doesn't say if he feels like it or if he's in a good mood, if you got up on the right side of the bed, right? If everything in the universe is going right, oh gosh, <laughs> like pastors always say, it's going according to plan. It doesn't look like a plan to us. And this is what I felt like the Lord said earlier when we were worshiping. If we all closed our eyes, 
we'd be, if, and I said, walk out of here with your eyes closed, we wouldn't do it because we'd trip and we'd fall. But guess what? In the dark, God still sees everything. God sees everything. So he knows everything that's going on in our lives. Don't worry. Don't worry. God loves us. He has all the hairs on our head counted. He sees us. He sees the birds. He cares about the birds. He cares about us, right? And if he says, bring the tithe to the storehouse, and he would rebuke the devourer, and he says, if, if you give to the poor, that God will take care of you, then he will, right? Because yeah. God can't lie. Amen? Amen? Amen. Lord, we thank you, and we praise you for how faithful you are, God, and how good you are to us, Lord. You're so merciful. If you gave us what we deserved, we would be in trouble. But you give us based on your covenant of mercy. And we thank you for that mercy and we thank you for your faithfulness. That we bring our tithe to you. You're going to rebuke the devourer when we give. When you tell us to give, wherever we t you tell us to give, we'll help us to do it, Holy Spirit. Because we know we can never outgive you and you will take care of us. In Jesus' name, amen.
Father, we are looking for the ones that are lost. Use us as ambassadors for your kingdom. I thank you for the anointing that is in this room to break every yoke and bondage, Father, that the enemy tries to enslave your people. We thank you for freedom and liberty here tonight. And we just thank you for all that you're doing, that the word would come forth with signs and powers, Father. Because you, Father God, are here. And we just thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, please pay attention to the screams for our announcements. Thank you. Attention. Attention all ladies. Yes, I'm speaking to you. Ladies, our next Lady of Victory and Encouragement meeting is going to be a luncheon held on Saturday, February 17th, at 12 noon. This is open to all girls and ladies who are of the sixth grade or older. I see so many new faces sitting out there. So I encourage you, if you're new to the church, take that step, sign up, come out so we can meet you and you can meet all the other ladies of the church. After we eat and have some fellowship, our children's minister, Jerry Weaver, is going to be sharing her testimony along with the Word of God. The price is $10 per person. Please pay when you sign up at the information table. If you wish to sign up online, you can go to our event section on our app or on our website and scroll down to upcoming events. Click on that and you can pay online. Remember, Saturday, February 17th, 12 noon, $10 per person. Hope to see you there. Have a great day. Come on and join us. God bless. family this announcement is for our seniors here at house on the rock family church we're going to be having seniors for christ on tuesday february 13th at 10 a.m so if you can make it go on out to the info desk and sign up we're going to have some breakfast fellowship and i'm going to be sharing a word for you guys i can't wait to see you there Praise the Lord, and clear your throats, everyone. <laughs> Praise God. Let's go before the Lord. Father, thank you so much that we have this opportunity to look into your word. Thank you that your Holy Spirit is here. He is our teacher, and we put our confidence and trust in him. We thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as your word is sown into our hearts, Lord, we thank you that you are changing us and molding us into the image of your dear son, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that he gave us an example to follow. And that example was that he did nothing, he said nothing, without hearing your voice first. So let us be the same way, in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. You can be seated. Hallelujah. Well, thank you again, Pastor, for the opportunity to minister tonight. Um, I'm excited to share what I have to share with you tonight. When I've taught this in the past, it's been a pretty long series, so I'm going to concise it to one Wednesday night because I don't get a lot of opportunities. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but, uh, but Pastor has been sharing um, lately, uh, or has uh, touched um, on Mark chapter 4, several times over the past few weeks, talking about the sower sowing the word. And it's important for us to understand, I think, that 
we don't really get the impact of this. I, I, let me speak for myself. I don't really get the impact of this because I don't sow seeds, physical seeds, like Pastor brought us out a packet of seeds. I'm not a farmer. Anytime I've tried to keep something alive, if someone gives me a plant, it, it's maybe a month, and I get excited if it lasts that long. Like, I'm just not good at that. And so um, the understanding this from a non-farming perspective, it, it's, it's kind of hard to understand. So you have to relate it to whatever you do consistently in your life because everything the Bible says, everything comes from the seed. Everything comes from the seed. And so the, the principles that God is teaching us in physical seeds that grow physical fruit and vegetables are not subject only to those things. They're subject to everything in your life. Amen? Amen. You give. Like Jesus, remember when Jesus said, the, way, the same way that you give, the same way that you measure out, it will be measured back to you. That was a form of sowing and reaping. That time he happened to be talking about judgment, which isn't great, but that's what he was saying. The same way that you judge, that's the way you'll be judged. And not only that, but you'll be judged good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. You throw out a little judgment, it's coming back hard and heavy. You know, so that's, you know, like he, he explained that it's a, it's a seed. Whatever seed you sow, you sow a seed of gossip, guess what? There's probably 10 people talking about you. <laughs> and so just know that whatever seed we sow, those things are going to reap a harvest. You can't resist it. You can't rebuke it. You can't come against it. You, it's, it's, it's the natural process that God has created. It's the law of the earth. And this happens to be where you are right now. So that's the law that we're under. Um, so the good part of the seed is that, you know, we are encouraged, like Paul says in Galatians, he says, hey, don't be weary in well-doing. Don't be weary in well-doing. In due time, you're going to reap. Amen? A lot of times people use those verses in Galatians to say people, see, you're going to reap what you sow. But Paul wasn't saying it that way. He was encouraging us to like, don't worry about it. It's coming. Amen? We're going to see that word tonight, patience. So let's get into it. The name of my message is Being Good Ground. And this is our choice. Amen? This is our choice to be good ground. And if you're impressed at my amazing graphics, thanks, Sarah. So let's look at Luke chapter 8. So this um, parable is in both Mark and Luke. And in Luke chapter 8, Starting at verse 4, Jesus says, And when a great multitude had gathered, and they had come to him from every city, he spoke by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, Jesus said, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on rock, and as soon as it sprang up, it withered away, because it lacked moisture. And some fell upon the, uh, among the thorns, and the thorns sprung up with it and choked it. But others fell on good ground, sprang up, and yielded a crop a hundredfold. In Mark, it says 30, 60, and a hundredfold. So you'll see different types of harvests. When he had said these things, he cried, He who has ears, let him hear. Now, this is an interesting parable. Uh, that we kind of get an inside view on. This might have happened a lot with the disciples, but this time we actually get this inside view of it. Because a lot of times Jesus just speaks parables and then the story's over. But this particular one, the disciples were, you know, later on, they were like, hey, uh, that was a really good story you told. Can you explain what you were talking about? And so we get like this inside view of this parable. He actually goes deeper into it. And his disciples asked him and saying, what does this parable mean? And he said, to you it has been given <clears throat> to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is given in parables, that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. You see, the Father wants you who are filled with the Holy Spirit, who have a relationship with him, to go deeper 
into this walk, into this relationship. The world doesn't understand. And a lot of times, even new believers, you know, you're reading your Bible and you're like, I don't, I don't really understand what's going on here. Let me just challenge you. You can understand what's going on there. Don't rely on me to explain it to you or Pastor Jim to explain it to you. Allow the Holy Spirit to start revealing it to you. Amen? That's how this relationship grows. And so don't just say, I don't understand the Bible, so I'm not going to read it anymore. Speak to the Holy Spirit. He's your helper. Jesus said he's your helper. Have you, ever had, have you ever had a helper with you at work but forgot to ask them for help? I do that all the time. I'm like, oh, gosh, I, I didn't have to be doing this by myself. I could have gotten help. And a lot of times we just don't ask. Amen? So he says this. Let's get into it. Now, the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear Then the devil comes and takes them away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. But the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root, who believe for a while, and a time of temptation makes them fall away. Then the ones uh, that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. But the ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. Amen? So tonight I want to look at these enemies of your fruitful life. The devil is not concerned about you going to heaven. He's lost that battle already. He just wants you to be unfruitful on your way to heaven. He wants you to be miserable on your way to heaven. Do you understand? He wants you to be ineffective with bringing the gospel to someone else on your way to heaven. And so we have to fight these enemies of our fruitful life. We have to acknowledge them. A famous warrior said, You must know your enemy. You got to know your enemy. If you think you're not in a battle and you are, you're probably getting your butt kicked. Right? And so you have to know your enemy. Can I say butt kicked? I did already. All right. All right. Very good. We'll talk. We'll talk later. So the first enemy to you being fruitful is seed thrown by the wayside. In Mark's account, it says that Satan comes immediately. That was, that was right now. He just came. Do you understand? Like he comes immediately when the word is being sown. When you're hearing the word, he comes immediately and says, this guy's not that good. He's not, he doesn't have anything to offer you, right? Things like that, or I'm really tired, or did I leave the stove on? I, f- I think I forgot if I unplugged the iron. Whatever the enemy is here to distract you, and to rob that seed, because as, as Luke says, lest you be saved. He doesn't want you to go advance. You're be- the Bible says not only that we are saved, but that we're being saved. That was actually what Jesus said to Nicodemus in the, in the actual uh, Greek. He actually said, you're being born again. Like you're recognizing something. By recognizing me, it's, the process is happening for you right now. And so that's, it's a process that we go through in our lives. And so the enemy comes immediately. He's a thief, right? That's, that's what Jesus said. That's his whole purpose is to, is to steal. And his whole purpose is first to steal God's word. If he can steal God's word, everything else in your life is temporary and is going to fall apart. So if he steals the promise of God's word, even those things that you have will eventually fall apart. Amen? The the promise of God's word is what sustains whatever you have and brings foundation to whatever you have. And so if you're holding on to your stuff and not holding on to your word, your stuff is going to fade and fail and disintegrate ultimately. I love that in Luke's account, the motivation is lest they believe and be saved. That's all Satan's concerned about, if you get it. Not concerned about you hearing the word, he's concerned about you getting it and going, oh, oh. That's when he starts to go, shoot. 
And so that's what we have to do. We have to understand this word. And unfortunately, even we just sung a song about strongholds, right? Unfortunately, we're focusing so much on strongholds in our lives. But let me show you a process that we miss oftentimes in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. So Satan comes immediately, and his goal is to get you to the, to the status of stronghold. But I want to tell you something right now. Strongholds don't come like that. Strongholds don't come immediately. And we see the process here in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, excuse me, chapter 10, you were right. Verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. And that, I, I could spend all night on that verse. Because Paul is not talking here about sinful flesh. He's talking here about law flesh. We do not live according to the law of flesh. And it, because the more you put yourself under the law, the more you end up in sin. Do you know that? The more you put yourself under the law and try to achieve the law by your works, by your good deeds, the more you, you perpetuate the law of sin and death. The law was put here to remind you that you can't live according to God's standard in your flesh. That's why it's here. And so the more you say, you know what, I'm going to try again today, <laughs> the more you're going to fall on your face. And so he says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. It doesn't come from do's and don'ts, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Notice the process here. The stronghold he starts with telling us what we're experiencing, but he says it starts with arguments. It starts with something that you, maybe you hear Pastor Jim say, and you go, I don't think that's right. And then, your, and then your thought process, and I'm, I'm just talking about, you hear the word of God, you hear something in the word of God, and your immediate flesh reaction is, I don't think so. Healing, healing's not for today. And then that's a thought, right? And then you go online or go on YouTube and look up, is healing for today? And you'll find plenty of people that say it's not. And now that thought becomes an imagination, and then that imagination grows into a stronghold. It's a process. And so the, if, you don't, if you don't nip it in the bud, if you don't capture that thought and allow the Holy Spirit to reveal his word to you, you will ultimately have a stronghold. And then that's something that you have to battle. And guess what? Strongholds are tougher to battle than thoughts. <laughs> Amen? You know, you, you ever see the, uh, the gate that comes down at the, um, at the entrance to, like, the Canadian border? You know, it comes down, and they check your car, and then they let you in. Some of us just have the gate up. You know, we just let every thought in. We don't, like, check it at the door. Right. You don't have to receive everything that comes into your mind. You don't have to dwell on those things and turn them into imaginations which ultimately turn into strongholds. You have, you can take that thought captive and say, wait a minute, let me examine you based on the word of God. Oh, okay, yeah, you agree with the word? All right, I'll let you in. Oh, you don't agree with the word? No. Out. If you don't do that, you probably got a lot of strongholds by now. <laughs> if you let every thought in, they've turned into imaginations, and you probably got some strongholds that you got to deal with. So, deal with it. Sorry, that wasn't supposed to be a long pause, but I figured it actually worked out. If you take the initial thought into captive, you will avoid the rest of the process. So the birds are hovering over the head every time a farmer plants. He's, they're hovering over. They're waiting to see if he drops any by the wayside, right? 
They're, they're hovering. They're looking for it. And, 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 and Luke says they get trampled underfoot, and then the birds come in. I mean, you get beat up if, you're, if that word is planted on the wayside. You're not getting anything out of it. It never even takes root. It never even sprouts up at all. And so it's important for us to never allow that to happen. Um, And as soon as the birds see that the seed is all sown and, oh, man, he didn't drop any, they move on to the next field. Amen? So the second enemy to your fruitful life is the seed sown on stony ground. And this is very different than the wayside. This believer receives the word with gladness, the Bible says. They receive it with joy. They get all excited. They hear the word. They're like, wow, this is really good. This is great. My life is about to change. They are excited to hear the great things of God and what he can do in their lives. So what happens? I believe that this warning of Jesus is talking about religion. I believe he is warning us here against religion. Because oftentimes God speaks a word to us and we get excited about it. And the first thing we do is we go share it with another believer, and they go, yeah. My pastor said, are you sure that's all you have to do? God's grace? I don't know. You know, we have to be good, too. You have to do good things, right? And that's never going to (laughs) end. Because that's how we are made. That's how humans are made. It's not the Christian's fault. That's how humans are built. We are built that way. Works, and you do this for me, I do that for you, right? It's, it's just the way we're built. You get what you deserve, right? Like, that's the way we're built. That's the way man is built. And so, when you recognize that, that's when you'll start to realize that maybe you should keep what God is speaking to you to yourself sometimes. But let's look into this um, attack. You know, sometimes you'll hear someone say, well, yes, you are free, but now you have to do this, this, and this to really be free. And too often we equate a lot of times in, in Mark's gospel, it says, when tri- in, in Luke's gospel, it says when temptation comes. In Mark's, it says when tribulation and persecution come. A lot of times we only attribute tribulation and persecution with what happens in the world. We don't attribute it to the church, to, the, to religion. But this is really what I believe Jesus is warning us against. And we can see where it happened in Galatians. If you go to Galatians chapter 3. So Paul ministers the gospel to uh, this Galatian church, which was made up of both Jewish believers and Gentile believers. Now, you don't understand racism if you didn't live in the first century, okay? <laughs> Whatever we've experienced in, 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 our, in our lives and on, in our earth was nothing compared to what they were living in this first century. I mean, Gentile means dirty. It's not like a, oh, you know, you're just a non-Jew. It means you're a dirty person. So it's not even like a slang. It's not even a a, a derogatory term. It's just like what you are. You're a Gentile. You're dirty. So this is the battle in this first century. Jesus comes, he brings, the, he brings freedom as the Messiah to the Jews, the Jews reject him, and then the door is open for the Gentiles. And most of the first Christians, most of the first, um, mo- a lot of Jews did not reject him, and they were the first church, and then Gentiles started coming in. These people never associated with each other. They never went to each other's house for dinner. They never looked at each other in a pleasant way. They hated each other. And they dwell together just because that's what you do, right? I mean, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, that you don't like someone or you don't agree with their culture or the way they stand. You live together. Like, you just deal with it. And, but that's the way it was. So when the Gentiles came into the church and it was filled with these Jews that were converted to Christianity, they were Jewish Christians, they said to the Gentiles, welcome, 
Uh, let's uh, sign you up for circumcision. Um, here are the dates that you have to, you know, celebrate these holidays. Um, you have to give this much, and you have to do these things. And so all of a sudden, these Gentiles that Paul was telling, hey, Jesus came, shed his blood, you don't have to do anything anymore, receive what he did, the price has been paid once and for all, and you'll be saved. And they said, really? And they, he said, yes. And they prayed, and he said, now go into this church. And they went to the church, and the people in the church said, well, Paul forgot to tell you some things. So that's, I'm giving you a little background of this letter. So now Paul's writing to these Christians that he ministered the gospel to. And in the third chapter, he starts off with this. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to know from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Again, flesh there does not mean sin. He wouldn't be saying, are you now being made perfect by sinful flesh? He's saying, are you now being made perfect by working the law in your flesh? Do you think that's really going to happen? And so this is why I believe that the the seed dropped along the the stones and sprouts up with excitement because no one can be a wet blanket like a religious person. I mean, there's nobody that can bring, bring the whole attitude down someplace than a religious person. And so when you don't realize that this is about relationship with the Father and experiencing Him in deeper ways then you're missing out. If the only thing you know about the Father is what Pastor Jim says on Sunday mornings, you got to question your whole walk. If that's the only, if the only thing you know about relationship with God is what you hear from the pulpit, that's not what this is about. It's about your walk with him. It's about your personal walk with him. You can't stand before him if you get rebuked on the day of judgment and go, but Pastor Jim said it. You have to have your personal conviction. This goes both ways, too. I've seen it go both ways in different churches. One church could have very liberal leaders that do things that are questionable, and then all of a sudden, everybody in the church is doing those things, even though when they came to the church, they had a conviction to not do those things. It's because they're just following the leader. When you stand before the Lord, he's not going to say, hey, how'd your group do? Amen? How did you do what, with what I told you? Amen? And let me tell you, it's going to be different. If you ever read Romans chapter 14, it's going to be different. Paul says one one Christian might look at certain days as being really, really important. And another Christian looks at every day as being the same. One Christian might drink a little wine with his meal. Another Christian might say, nope, no wine. One Christian might eat meat offered to idols. Another one says, that's sinful. Paul doesn't say, hey, come on, everybody get on the same page with this stuff. Paul says, respect one another, love one another. The temporary things are temporary things. Amen? Of course, you can't take it beyond the word of God. Amen? Well, I don't think adultery is really that bad, right? We can't take it beyond what the word of God says. The word of God says it's sin, it's sin. Amen? So you have to ask yourself, are you under a religious spell? It's a spell, Paul said. You've been bewitched. You've been convinced. And that's the the root that is lacking. See, when when you're rooted in God's word and someone says something that you disagree with, It doesn't mean that you're not going to that church anymore. Do you know what I mean? Because you're going to hear things you disagree with. 
It just means that you have different convictions. Amen? And until God changes that in you, it shouldn't change. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? That's the freedom that we have in Christ. Establish your walk with the Lord and have it biblically based. And then whatever somebody says to you doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You don't even have to argue about it. That's, unfortunately, that's the other thing we do. We're like, we get into an argument as if you're going to convince me, right? Like, I, I know I'm not convincing you, so why are we even having this discussion? Amen? Let's just move on to eternal things. The final enemy of you living a fruitful life for Christ is seed among the thorns. And the weeds, I'm going to add, because we experience that a lot. Do you ever notice about weeds and thorns that, you know how certain plants grow in certain conditions? Yeah, you have sunny, shady. You notice weeds and thorns? Like, they're on every side of my house. I mean, the north, the east, the south, the west, sides that get no sun, sides that are full of sun. The same exact weeds are everywhere. I'm like, how, how, how are these things alive through everything? And I can't grow grass, which is probably your weed too. But, um, but, <laughs> but it's, it's really amazing about weeds because what they do is they use the nourishment from the good stuff. And that's, that's, that's what we're going to see here with these thorns. This is probably the biggest attack on the church today. Mark quotes Jesus saying that these thorns or weeds are cares of the world, deceitfulness of riches, desire for other things, and that they enter in to choke the word and make you unfruitful. They enter in. Both truth and lies are seeds. Do you understand? Truth and lies are seeds. Every one of those weeds, don't ask me where they came from, because again, I don't know a lot about seeds, but every one of those weeds, somehow that seed got there. I don't know how it got there, but somehow that seed got there, and that's how you got that weed. And then when you run it over at your lawnmower like I do, you spread them. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, they're everywhere. Um, and so that's how, that's how seeds work. So every Instagram post, every TikTok post, every YouTube video, every tweet, or whatever you're into, is a seed. It's a seed. Every seed that's contrary to God's word will produce a weed, or a thorn, or something that wants to choke away God's word. You're carrying around a pocket full of seed. And we get consumed with it as if it's not seed. As if nothing's really being planted. It's mindless. Or worse yet, you think it's really valuable and you're getting a lot of really good information from it. Let me tell you, that guy in his basement, he used to be the guy that no one paid any attention to. Now he's got a billion clicks. That's the, that's the brains that you're counting on. That's the one that you're getting all your info from. He's got the, he knows, he knows. Yeah, he knows. He knows how to get clicks. That's what he knows. Information isn't always good. Amen? I saw a funny tweet said, uh, and we all thought that when we got more information, we'd all get smarter. We've certainly proved that wrong, right? Um, and so all of that seed that we let in, those seeds thrive on being contrary. They thrive on killing the word. That's what weeds and, 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 and thorns do. They thrive on that. They want the nutrients just like you're trying to get the nutrients out of that fruit and those vegetables, well, that's what the weeds are doing. They want it. Amen? In 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. 
If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. In Luke's gospel, Jesus said that the flourishing plant that brings Um, that begins to grow in the Christian's life can be choked with cares, choked with riches, choked in pursuing pleasures of life. So are you full of cares? Whether you have riches or not, how important are riches to you? You know, a lot of times people say, well, that person's so rich, they're, you know, consumed with riches. I've seen a lot of poor people consumed with riches. At my lowest financial state, all I could think about was money. It wasn't like I was like, oh, I'm glad I don't have that money stuff like those rich people. (laughs) Are you consumed with what the world calls pleasure? In Luke's gospel, the account Jesus um, speaks of fruit that never matures. How many of you, like me, hate supermarket fruit? Right? The peaches are like, it's a little hard, not quite ripe yet. I think they might have picked that three months early. The bananas are green, right? It's, and a lot of Christians, that's what you taste like to the world. You taste like immature fruit. You taste like fruit that was picked too early. It never ripened. It never got to the place of like, wow, don't you love when you get a good piece of fruit? Amen. See, the Lord wants your fruit to be mature. He wants it to come to a place where the world goes, wow, what's, what's different about you? And in this world right now, we don't look very different. We don't look very different. This is a self-centered, self-consumed world. And Christians, sometimes we look just as narcissistic as everybody else. And we have to, we have to come against it. We have to stop it personally, individually. It's not about you. Listen to yourself. If every other word you say is I, you probably got to calm down. Like, if if everything is about you, you you probably need to check yourself. Serve somebody. Amen? Amen? Amen. Empty yourself. Sacrifice. Be like Jesus. Jesus came and washed the feet of the disciples. Being around self-centered Christians, I said that already, is like, eat, like eating green bananas and rock-hard peaches. Those are my two least favorite unripe fruit, although there's a lot of others too. <laughs> if we're just as narcissistic as the world, then we offer them no hope. Listen to yourself. Listen to your conversation. Allow others to speak and let the Holy Spirit lead you to bring them Answers. Amen? Not just combat. Well, the Word of God says this. Well, I believe this. Come on. Come on. Who are you talking to? Talking to someone that's hurting, someone that's dying, someone that's depressed and needs hope, not rebuke. So let's look at good fruit as we close. Or good ground, excuse me. I think understanding good ground is understanding what not to do oftentimes. Right? Good ground, receive the word as as Luke recorded Jesus saying with a, a noble heart. Right? Open up to what the word of God says. But here's how your heart becomes noble. Here's how your heart is ready to keep the word of God. In regards to Satan coming immediately to steal from the good ground? Good ground is aware of the enemy's devices and knows that he is stalking. So if you're good ground, then you're not surprised when the enemy comes. Amen? You don't allow the birds to eat the seed. You don't allow anyone to trample over that seed. You're conscious of what's going on in the spiritual. It does whatever it takes to make sure the seed gets planted. That's what good ground does. 
It stays harvest-minded so knows the true value of the seed. You see, a farmer, when he is planting that seed, Jesus said he plants the seed and he goes to bed at night. He doesn't know how it happens. But that harvest comes. Amen? So just be harvest-minded when it comes to hearing the word of God. In regards to seed sown on stony ground, good ground knows that God, God's word is offensive, especially to the religious. So you have to understand that freedom in God's word isn't always going to be received by other Christians. And you know what? You might not be there yet to even share it. Sometimes God says something to you, and you go tell your brothers, hey, I'm gonna be, you're going to be serving me one day, and you get thrown into a pit and end up a slave in Egypt. Do you know what I'm saying? Sometimes you got to hold that word in your heart before you blab it out because one of the things that the Lord gave me one day is own it, hone it, then clone it. So you got to own it first. Then you got to hone it. You got to make it like really, re like you got it. And then you can start to share it with others. But a lot of us get it and we're like, hey, God just revealed something to me. I, I don't know how many times I've done it and I get this look. Yeah? I'm like, oh, it's not that good, huh? Okay, forget it. Forget I said anything. But anyway, got to hone, gotta hone it before you, before you clone it. Um. Uh, good ground puts energy and effort into studying God's word, meditating on it, and praying it. You have to do that. Like, that's what good ground does. It's not going to be stony ground. Keep, keep, um, it, I'm sorry, good ground keeps God's word hidden in their heart and does not argue and minds their own business. That's what good ground does. Mind your own business. It's better. Trust me, it's better. You might think you know better than that person, but just mind your own business. You'll be fine. And when it comes to seeds sown in thorns and weeds, good ground does not allow the seeds of cares, riches, and pleasures to be planted. So when you're looking at your phone, when you're getting those seeds sown, sometimes you got to be like, nope, not letting that in. Nope, not letting that in. And sometimes you need to go turning that off, putting that down, not looking at it for a couple hours. A couple hours? You can do it. You can do it. I remember when I didn't have a phone. Do you remember? <laughs> it was attached to a wall anyway. <laughs> Good ground is not a friend to the world or its value system. Good ground weeds out contradictions to God's word daily because no matter how much you avoid it, weeds will grow. Amen? So no matter how much you think you avoided weeds from getting planted and avoided weeds from coming in and thorns from coming in, if you don't tend that garden every day, all of a sudden you'll look out there and go, wow, those tomato plants look totally different. <laughs> yeah, because they're weeds now. Um, and that's what weeds will do. And so you have to weed every day. Check yourself every day. Amen? So I just wanted to add to what Pastor has been sharing about the seed and understanding what those contrary things are that we have to battle in our lives. And, um, and so hopefully you got something out of that tonight. Would you, would you stand to your feet with me? Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. We always want to give you the opportunity to receive Jesus. Um, every one of us did this one day or one night. Um, we confessed Jesus as our Lord, and, and our lives changed. Um, and so we encourage you to, to do that. I'm, I think I know pretty much everyone in here, but if I'm missing somebody, then let's just pray this prayer. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God raised them from the dead, you will be saved. For with the mouth confession is made, and with the heart man believes unto righteousness. And so, just say this with me. Say, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father I thank you, I thank you for, sending for sending your best, for sending Jesus, for sending Jesus to, die to die on a cross, to shed his blood. Shed his blood. But I thank, you I thank you that he did not remain, did not remain in the grave. He was raised on the third day 
and he's seated in heavenly places at your right hand. And right now, I receive him as my Lord and Savior. I thank you that he forgives me of all my sin, past, present, and future. I thank you that he is with me and he'll never leave me nor forsake me. I thank you that you call me your child. In Jesus' name, I am cleansed by your blood. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So I'm going to ask you right now, did anyone pray that prayer for the first time tonight? Never prayed that prayer before. Like I said, I'm pretty sure I know everybody here, but glory to God. Amen. Let's just, um, as, we're, as we're leaving tonight, the worship team is going to lead us. Let's just build our life on the promise. Amen? Build our life on the promise of God's word. Amen. Amen. Go ahead, you guys. If anyone needs prayer, please come on up. We'll pray over you. Thank you. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. your heart.
Father, we thank you so much for your word. That word that was sown is sown on good ground, Father. We will, we will have a harvest of a hundredfold. Father, we are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but it is the power of God unto salvation. Father, we're your ambassadors. We're here for you. And that word that was we receive it tonight with gladness, Lord, that we can go about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. So we just thank you and we praise you for this time of encouragement, Father, this, con this time of teaching. Lord, just bless us and let us grow together as a family. And I just thank you. We, I praise you, Lord, that we'll get home safe tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll see you all on Sunday. God bless.